Greetings to all the participants for the climate change communication training. My name is um, Daniel Letongo and I'll be taking you through the science of climate change in order to lay the foundation so that we understand what is climate change as we engage in this training on climate change communication. Here is a short outline on what we are going to have in this presentation. The first being how is climate different from weather? What is climate change? Role of the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Difference between climate change and global warming. Anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade. And of course, the importance of climate change science. In order to understand what is climate, I think the point of departure should be the weather. And weather is what is happening in the atmosphere at any given time. So these are simply daily occurrences. While climate, on the other hand, is the average weather over a longer time period. This could be like 35 years and above, even up to like decades. Now we move to what is climate change. Sometimes when the question is being posed, what is climate change? People can react differently based on their understanding. But climate change in terms of the intergovernmental um, panel on climate change usage refers to a change in the state of the climate that can be identified either using statistical tests, so it has to be proven statistically by changes in the mean and or the variability of its properties. These properties, they could be um, temperature, rainfall, wind speed, humidity that have persisted over an extended period of time. How is climate change different from global warming? Sometimes there's all, all often this kind of confusion and people try to use both terms interchangeably, but that is not true. Global warming refers to the overall warming of the planet based on average temperature over the entire surface of the earth. So when we talk of global warming, we talk about like an increase in the earth's temperature and it affects different society or communities differently. Why climate change, on the other hand, refers to changes in climate characteristics, including temperature, humidity, rainfall, wind, and severe weather events over a longer time period. We move now to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, simply IPCC. The IPCC was created in 1988 and some of its activity involve reviews and assessing existing scientific literature, publishing reports on climate change, provide a scientific basis for policy making. And there are three working groups to achieve the, the objective of the IPCC. One of them is the science of climate change. The other is the impacts adaptation and vulnerability and one of them or the third one is mitigation so reports are being produced periodically and one of the most recent report of the ipcc was released in october 2018 which is the 1.5 degrees centigrade in reference to the pre-industrial levels as a baseline so we are going to have a look at this shortly. What does that report? What is the implication of that report to communities, to livelihood, to security, even to national development? What then is the mandate of the IPCC to the global community? So IPCC is a scientific body established by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program and what are they to achieve? What are they supposed to do? 
is to provide the world with a clear scientific view on the current state of climate change and its potential environmental and socioeconomic consequences. And of course, there are thousands of scientists from all over the world who contribute to the work of the IPCC. And they do this on a voluntary basis. It's very important to note that the IPCC, they won the Nobel Peace Prize of 2007. We often talk about climate change or drivers of climate change, sometimes anthropogenic drivers of climate change. What are some of the causes of climate change? Looking at the global greenhouse gas emission by economic sector, we see on the pie chart that agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, they contribute 24% of emissions globally. But this is a little bit less than 1% to what is coming from electricity and heat production. So electricity and heat production contribute most. When we look at industrial activity, it also contributes 21% of our global emissions and then is followed by transportation. So these are some of the key sectors that contribute to carbon dioxide emission or other greenhouse gases. And we are going to have a look at three of the major greenhouse gases and how much they contribute to what we call global warming. So some of the causes in more detail, we see the photo to the top right, the aviation industry, also, the are key emitter, the one to the top left, the use of vehicles, both public and private transportation. They contribute a lot because we use fossil fuel. The one to the bottom left, we see industrial activities from manufacturing. They emit a lot of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And the one to also the, the bottom right, we see agricultural activity converting forests into other land uses. Also the use of maybe like um, pesticide is also very important. Use of um, synthetic fertilizers. These are products that have been produced from intensive industrial processes that emit a lot of greenhouse gases, more importantly carbon dioxide. Cement production is also one of the key drivers of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emission. We have also marin maritime transportation and also infrastructural development. We are converting our forests into other land uses. This is important even in the Seychelles with a very small land area of 455 kilometers square and with a growing population. There is a need for us to expand infrastructural development even into protected forest areas or on reclaimed land and when we are doing this we are destroying the carbon habitats and we are releasing the carbon into the atmosphere it brings us also to a very key and important topic on two important forest areas globally the one to the left is the congo basin forest area in most of central africa and then the one to the right is the Amazon rainforest. Some scientists, they have described the Amazon as the lungs of the earth. So without the forest, we can't breathe. Because the forest, they are a carbon sink. Through the process of photosynthesis, they use carbon dioxide to produce carbohydrate. And at the end of the day, oxygen is released as a byproduct, which is important for us to survive on earth. But the time we begin to look at the activities that are going on in these forest areas, deforestation, agricultural activity, um, logging for timber, mining activities, all of these activities are converting the forest into other land uses and releasing the carbon that was stored in the trees back into the atmosphere. And those who have been involved in carbon dating research, they will tell you that a molecule of carbon dioxide will take 100 years in the atmosphere to disintegrate. So even if we have to stop emissions today, the amount of temperature increase globally will not change overnight. 
So what we can do is to enhance the carbon sink. We can do that by some kind of reforestation activity, tree planting activities, and in Seychelles, um, we talk of blue carbon. So the ocean space is a very important carbon sink. The sea grasses, they are important. So these are the kind of ways that we can sequester carbon from the atmosphere. The photos, they try to highlight some of the activities. The one to the um, top left, these are logging activities for timber, hardwoods. And then the guy with the black vest, these are mining activities. And of course, before you get into the subsoil, you have to um, take off the trees that are on the surface. And you see cattle ranching is happening a lot in the Amazon rainforest. Oil palm plantation, the one in the middle, is very key. Indonesia is one of the countries that have faced a lot of deforestation because of oil palm plantation. And of course, the palm oil, we use it a lot in the cosmetic industry. It has huge potential. Now, understanding global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade, what is the implication if we have to hit 1.5 degrees centigrade in reference to the pre-industrial levels? Human activities are estimated to have caused approximately 1 degree centigrade of global warming above pre-industrial level. Of course, with a likely range of 0 0.8 to 1.2. And I think at the moment, we should be close to 1.3, 1.4. We are not too far away from the 1.5 degrees. Global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees centigrade between 2030 and 2052 if it continues to increase at the current rate which means if we continue with the business as usual, our industrial processes, um, development that are not low carbon emission pathways um, oriented. So this is going to still continue to increase our emissions of greenhouse gases. Warming from anthropogenic emission from the pre-industrial period to the present will persist for centuries to millennia and will continue to cause further long-term changes in the climate. When we look at the global temperature since pre-industrial era, it shows that it has been increasing. We hit the one degrees mark around um, 2015, and we are somewhere in between 1.2 and 1.3 degrees. So we are not too far from hitting the 1.5 degrees centigrade mark that the IPCC is already raising a red alert. And of course, the Industrial Revolution contributed a lot to greenhouse gas emission, especially carbon dioxide emission into the atmosphere. Just a, um, a glance at the major greenhouse gases. There are several of them, but these are the three major greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, uh, methane, nitrous oxide. And when you look at the, the graph to the, the bottom right, you see a combination of all the three major greenhouse gases. It shows that they have been increasing consistently over the years. Then we move to the flow chart on greenhouse gas emissions globally. Important to note is what is happening with electricity and heat. You see the 32.4 degrees. 32.4 percent, sorry and also transportation, which is 27.2%. So a lot of greenhouse gas emission is coming from this sector. And you see the contribution of carbon dioxide is estimated close to 85%. So it is one of the most important greenhouse gas that is being emitted into the atmosphere. When we go into more details on global greenhouse gas emission by gases, we see carbon dioxide from fossil fuel and industrial processes contributing 65%. And then carbon dioxide from what we call the AFOLU sector, agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, contributing 11%. These are activities that we are converting our forests into other land uses and releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And of course, methane. Methane is very important here in the Seychelles because 
with our landfills, it contributes a lot to the emission of methane because we do not recycle waste here in the Seychelles. And we have what we call the F gases that contribute just 2% of um, greenhouse gas emissions. We call the fluorinated gases. And of course, some examples of them, we have hydrofluorocarbons, fluorocarbons, sulfur, hexafluoride, and nitrogen trifluoride coming from air conditioning system and also from refrigerants. We have a look now at carbon dioxide emission based on life footprints. So flying a round trip from New York to Los Angeles is estimated about um, 0.9 tons of carbon dioxide emissions per person. And driving an average car in the United States of America is estimated at 5.4 tons of carbon annually. Then living in a detached family home with four bedrooms, a comparison between two states in the United States of America, California and Michigan, you see 20 tons of carbon dioxide per family annually in California, and more than double, 51%, 51 tons of carbon dioxide per family annually in Michigan. So it tells us, looking at this um, carbon dioxide um, emission based on life footprint that Michigan is much more cooler and requires more energy. But now at the much more national averages comparing different countries, one person in the United States will contribute to 25 tons of carbon annually, while one person in India is just one ton of carbon annually. So you can see the difference. Despite the population in India, the, the life footprint on, on, on CO2 emission is quite low. What do we think about this when we have to bring this into the sessions? Now, climate change science allows us to do the following. Understand how and why the climate is changing. Assess how humans are influencing climate. Project how the climate may change in the future. And of course, support policy and decision making and changes in behavior. Why is climate change science important? It's important because sound weather data and focus are important for short-term planning and also for emergency responses. Climate model helps to focus long-term climate scenario. Of course, when we talk about projection for like future sea level rise, this is part of climate change science. Important input for vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning. There is no comprehensive study in the Seychelles on vulnerability assessment be it on the kind of like um, social vulnerability or physical vulnerability who is more vulnerability who is more vulnerable and in terms of vulnerability what particular district is more vulnerable to the impact of climate change in the Seychelles? we need this information to be able to design our adaptation action or planning and of course lastly Climate change science is important because it fosters climate resilient development and also avoid maladaptation. There have been a lot of international responses to climate change. I won't go into all the details starting from the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to the Kyoto Protocol. But of importance is, the, is what we call the national determined contribution that came out very clear from the Paris Climate Agreement. And each country is making um, this transition, especially in the energy sector, from fossil fuel um, energy sources into more renewable energy technology, which has to be documented in national communications. And at the moment, Seychelles is um, in the process of producing its state national communication and also by annual um, reports or review is ongoing. This is COP24, COP24 that just ended. I think that was in Madrid in the month of December last year. Thank you for your attention.